takes this elect the atom or the electron and it starts oscillating it. And slowly, if you remember that diagram of how radiation is emitted, it oscillates between the, the upper and lower level through the lifetime, and you get many cycles, and it goes out. And so that's your simulated emission. And the lasing process works by heating the plasma. So there's a lot of atoms or, or ions in the x-ray case. And at some point, some of them will be into the upper level. And you'd like an upper level which has a long enough lifetime that it stays there for a little while, while another photon can come by and stimulate the process. And so, um, I don't know if, I'm, if it's sounding clear or not. So you, you wind up with a lot of atoms, some in the upper state, some in the lower. If you're in equilibrium, you'll have um, more in the lower state than the upper state. That doesn't work so well. So you need to get out of equilibrium. You want more in the upper state and less in the lower state. That was one of the secrets of how lasing came to be understood. But anyway, so you wind up in some situation which you create, you have to understand how to create it, where you have more atoms in the upper state, and then just happens that one of these photons come near enough to one of the atoms in the upper level and makes it oscillate and it emits. Now you've got two photons, and uh, to some extent they're going in the same direction, uh, although some clarification is required there. And now you've got two photons that could stimulate another atom. So rather than one, you've got two chances at it. Okay? And this multiplies, and it becomes an avalanche effect. And although you may have, um, so he here is shown one photon producing two, two producing three. This is the avalanche, and then there's radiation going out. At the same time, these randomly emitted photons can be from, from any one atom or ion could be going in any direction. So um, we're kind of emphasizing what's going along here because that's what leads to amplification and eventually you see it as a big effect. But your photons can go out in any direction. So again, somehow or other you have some medium, you put a lot of energy into it one way or another, you shine lasers into it or a flash lamp with a lot of flashlight. It doesn't have to have any particular energy, it just needs to heat it up enough so that you reach it, so that you have a lot of atoms in some excited states, or ions in ex excited states, and then you need these processes to happen. And that again depends on the fact that you have more in the upper level going down than in the lower level going up. That's absorption. You don't, that's the usual process, you don't see anything. <coughs> so, could I answer a question now? Or someone make a comment? Yeah. yeah maybe, uh about the energy of photons which are striking? The energy of? Of photons, which is striking. Yeah, it has to be perfect. It has to be a perfect match to this. So what you need is, first you need, in the heating process, you, you produce a lot of atoms in different ions, uh, with, and some of them are in an upper state, okay? And when it drops down, the photon energy here, h bar omega, exactly set by the difference of energy levels, right? And it has to be a perfect match then to any other atom it comes near. Okay. And, and if it's a perfect match, you'll get, you'll be able to, uh, you'll have this process where you uh, stimulate the photon and they both go uh, off. Now, it turns out in the beginning of the process, they're not all going in the same direction. That, that evolves as you get many of these processes happening at the same time, it evolves and then you get this nice laser light going in the forward direction. Uh, w w we'll speak more about this later, but this light is not necessarily uh, coherent in all senses. It, it has a very narrow, narrow line width because it's, it's a precise match to these energy levels and so you saw that narrow line before and so there's a certain thing called temporal coherence, longitudinal coherence. It has that automatically. But spatial coherence, which we'll speak about in a moment, it doesn't necessarily have. Uh, I'll show you a diagram of a good visible light laser cavity, and you'll see, and I'll sh sh show you in that case how you get the, the coherence out of this. But maybe I should just see if there's any more questions or thoughts. What kind of lasers do we use to find? 
you can do, there's all different things. You don't have to use a laser to pump it, although that's, you know, that's often the case. Um, sometimes they use uh, a flash lamp for visible light. That's how the first lasers were made, was they had a rod, a solid rod, and they had a flash lamp. And they just put a lot of electrical current through the flash lamp. It gives off a lot of light and, and a lot. But it's like, it's, it's in the visible one. Yeah. Like yeah, so, uh, uh, right, so for instance, you can use a laser to pump, like the schemes that uh, Roka uses, Jorge Roca in Colorado. They focus um, some other laser, like a neodymium laser or something. They focus it onto a target. So they'll have some situation. They may have some some long material like this, and they'll shine some other laser. There's lots of choices, but let's say it's a neodymium uh, YAG or some other thing at 1.06 micron wavelength, and they, sh they shine it onto a, th a thin film, and this thing it gets very very hot here, up to temperatures. It depends on what lasing you want, but let's say up to temperatures of a few hundred EV. Okay, so the ions that are here, you know, they had a, a plus Z here, and they had a lot of electrons around it. And at this temperature, you put a lot of light in, and it created a hot plasma. So there's a lot of electrons running around, and perhaps 100 EV, and they, you know, you had electrons here in all of these orbits and with these a uh, few hundred EV electrons going around these guys get wiped out okay and so now you'll have something some other cadmium plus something or other okay and this has its energy levels but uh, and now maybe you used to have electrons up here but you don't have them anymore. You still have electrons here. Okay, and now you've you've removed these two electrons. You just knocked them off, and there's still some electrons that could recombine. But hopefully, that's going to take a little bit longer time. And maybe there's another level up here, and uh, you could have some some situation where you have left here perhaps one electron, let's just say, and maybe it just goes up into this level. So now it's up here, it's not down there. This is your upper level and this is your lower level and you're hoping to see this guy go down and throw out a photon, okay? So that was just one of these atoms, that was this guy. He threw out a photon of a characteristic energy, H bar omega, very precisely, okay? And he happens to go near this one which has also happened to be up in the same state. There may be other atoms nearby, but they were not in the upper state. So there's not much of an interaction there. But he comes to another nearby atom, which is in the upper level. And he, so this is now this one over here. And uh, this photon is now on the other side. So it's, it's this, this one's given off the photon coming to this atom. And this guy's up there, and now you get this, you get the lasing effect. This one makes this one come down, and now you've got two photons. Okay? Now you've got two photons here going, and you come to another, another atom nearby. There, there are many, many, many of them. Not all in the right conditions, but it's the ones that are in the right condition that matter. And you come to a third, another atom and you get three photons coming out, okay? So the original, you, what, you can use different mechanisms to put energy in here, and in the X-ray laser case, you generally are putting in some other laser energy, a visible light or infrared light or something like that, okay? Uh, just one question. Yeah. Uh, energy you can put the energy difference between these three photons? These three? Yeah. Essentially nothing. 
uh, if you look at the, the emission spectrum here, it, where this is, let's say, frequency, or, or photon energy or frequency, it's going to be an extremely narrow line. Maybe uh, delta h bar omega over h bar omega is approximately 10 to the minus 4, something like that. It's an extremely narrow line. Yeah. Okay, so how did that compare? Uh, so that's an example of how you would do lasing energy. You create some other visible light laser that's very intense and it's a short pulse, and you hit your uh, some uh, material, some very thin uh, strip of material, for instance. And in general, you like to do it in a long strip because you want to get this idea of laser energy shooting out the end this way, and perhaps also in this direction, right? So you want some, you want some little tube. You want to produce a little tube of plasma that's long, a few centimeters long, and this way, it's only about 100 microns, even after expanding. It starts at less than 100 microns, right? And so you'd make this of some material that you're hoping, you've looked at the energy levels that are available, and you've chosen some material um, that you put a thin coating on here that you w will get lasing in some lines that you've matched. You know, you're, you're going to have to be careful in the intensity in watts per centimeter squared here to create a, te a plasma of just the right temperature that it's going to create this uh, ionization just to a certain level. Remember we talked about ionization bottlenecks. This is a case where it's really important to get the temperature right so that you, you, you have an ion that's left over that ju has just the right number of uh, electrons left, right? For instance, you don't want to have a, but here's what you don't want to have, uh, some different place. You don't want to have a situation like this where you've got two here and you've got six here and Let's say you've got some up here, you've got one empty, and here you've got two, or something like that, or three. You don't want to wind up with that situation where you have different levels of ionization along here. You really, because the energy levels will shift a little bit. If, if this one has not the exact same number of electrons, the energy level is going to change just a little bit. And now you're going to have two different emission lines. Or if you have plus eight ionization, plus eight net charge, and plus nine, and plus ten, you're going to wind up with three different lines. Well, you don't want to spread your energy around like that. You're just going to make this thing laze. You want everything to be in a single line. So you want to have an ionization situation where the temperature here, the electron temperature for energy, uh, is such that it's removing electrons from the ion, but uh, but you reach a bottleneck, right? Is that not, not clear, maybe? Uh, I, have, I can go back to a slide we talked about yesterday. Well, I, these all things are more or less uh, the process of lasing, I guess. Yeah. My theory is that well, if we want to make uh, an X-ray laser, the radiative means photons are highly more important. Yes. Than, than that. Yes. The pumping Great question. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and it's, but it's not the case, actually, but it's a really good question. What's happening is here the photons each have an energy of about 1 EV, approximately. And you're coming in with so many of them that they're each hitting the, the atoms here, and they're collectively producing an ionization state where they're removing you know, um, 50 EV worth of, photon, uh, of electrons. So it's not, the incoming photon does not have to have as much energy as this one. This one may be, let's say, um, uh, 60 EV or something like that. Okay? This is only one EV. So many of these photons are hitting an atom here and producing the ionization state that you need. Not, it's not a, a multi-photon process, 
and you can just look at it classically, there's an intensity and uh, just, uh, I'm going to make a picture of a, what's happening here? Well, here are some of the wavelengths that Roca has made to Lays in, in Colorado. I didn't mean to go there at this moment. These are different lasers that wavelengths, which he's been able to saturate, get as much energy out as possible. So just to give you some idea, um, right, so these are photon energies of 60 to 100 EV. But that's not where I wanted to go. This is where I wanted to go. Remember, I was telling you about bottlenecks and the match to the electron temperature. So the, the example, so these are all different elements. Uh, but the one that's just highlighted here, we could look at any one, would be argon, which normally has 18 electrons. And let's say you want to make a laser, an, uh, in the, an X-ray laser with argon. And so you heat it with some, in some manner. And you start stripping off electrons. So you started with 18 electrons. And this is how much energy is required to remove the 12th electron. So you've gotten it down from 18 to 12. You've already removed the outer electrons, the valence electrons, which were only held with, let's say, 5 or 6 EV. And you've stripped them off. And now you're coming down, and you've still got 12. And if you have, a, if you have an electron in your plasma, uh, with an energy of 124 eV, you can take away the 12th electron and you'll be over here with 11 electrons. Now you need more energy. It's more tightly held because the nucleus has is is, is got 18 of, of protons, so it's still pulling. And so to remove the 11th electron takes 143 eV. So you need, this says that you need a plasma that has electrons in it with this kind of energy, 150. It's usually about three to one. So you'd need like a 50 EV plasma. So you've got to adjust the intensity uh, to produce a plasma of about 50 EV, so that has a lot of 150 EV electrons. And now you've removed the 11th electron, and you're in a neon-like state, which is a closed shell. And now it takes 423 EV to remove one of the 10. And in your <clears throat> 50 EV plasma, it's not likely to happen. It will happen, but not very often, because the electron distribution is going off. And so this would be a bottleneck where your argon ions will almost all be with 10 electrons. That's what I call an ionization bottleneck. It stops the process. And that gives you a situation where you've only got one set of ions. They're all argon plus 10. Okay. So, and then, but there are some other levels up here, and so uh, you've got. Uh, say. Oh, thank you. Uh, right, argon. Uh, it's got ten electrons, so it's argon plus eight. Thank you. <laughs> plus eight. So it started. It started with eighteen. And uh, what did, we're left with 10. You said you want to move in No, I, I uh, yes, I wanted to leave, uh, I wanted to be left with 10 electrons, which is a closed shell. So I'm in plus eight, right? Okay, so I started with eight, and I, uh, I removed, I removed eight, right? Started with 18, and I removed eight electrons. So I, I have actually, argon has got 10 electrons, but we call it plus eight state. Okay, sorry for the confusion. Okay, and that's all we have. We don't have any plus nines, we don't have any plus sevens or anything else, so everyone's here. And now, rather than have uh, lasing on three possible lines, we only have lasing on one line. Okay, this will work, and the other kinds wouldn't work. So this is one of the, the best examples of this ionization bottleneck. So for the elements that Roca was able to make lase, uh, he would adjust the temperature, the intensity and the temperature so that he could get just one ionization state. And then what happens is to remove one of these electrons into the continuum, we saw it was like 400 and something EV. That was a lot of energy to get it all the way into the continuum, 400 and 
30 EV or something like that. But it's not so much energy to go up, let's say, up to here. Okay? Maybe that's 100 EV, 150 EV. Now you could get, this could be the upper level, this could be the lower level, and this would be where you're oscillating and emitting. Okay. Make a little more sense now? Yeah. Okay. So then, uh, so a different question, I'm going to erase this, a different thing, which will relate then to the coherence properties, is how does a visible light laser work? So I'm going to show some mirrors, and I'm going to show a rod with ends cut at the Brewster angle, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to show some flash lamp where there's an electrical discharge in that produces a lot of light and the light pumps this thing. So this may be neodymium is a common laser that gets uh, good output at uh, 1.06 microns. And so you, and it's not always made with flash lamp now, but, uh, and so, it's the same sort of thing that went on before. The light from the flash lamp pumps the ions, so there's a, there's a lot of energy levels, and there's a certain place where there's a good situation where you can get electrons into an upper state and there's a lower state, and it's a good situation because the lifetime is kind of long, okay? The rules for uh, a transition from here to here, not very favorable. So the, the atom kind of stays in that level for a long time, and it gives enough opportunity for another photon to come by and produce the two photons. So lifetime is an important effect here. But so now in a visible light, it starts the same way. Some initial um, uh, atoms throw a photons in the wrong direction. Okay? It, they can go any place. And they're just lost. They're gone. But one of them happens to go in the right direction. And he, uh, that photon hits another atom in the excited state. There are others that are in the wrong state. It just goes right past. You know, it, There may be some scattering, or maybe not. But, it, it just, but when it comes to another atom, which is also in the excited state, it's resonant. This photon has the precise right frequency to make this guy oscillate and emit a photon. So this starts, and it goes off in this direction, and it goes off in this direction. And now, the, so far, the lasing process looks the same. We don't have what's called the cavity. The cavity is the mirrors and some other things. So this starts going this way, and maybe this is a 100% mirror, and this is a 90, let's say, some number, 95%. So when it comes, it gives a little bit of the light comes out here, not so important, because it's just starting. And it 95% bounce, bounces back, and now there's a lot of amplification. It's gone through one full of these things, so it's had a doubling, a tripling, a quadrupling. It's got many photons here now coming out, and they come back, and now they come back, and it's really like an avalanche, a snowplow. And now you're getting a much stronger thing coming out here. There are still these little emission processes happening, uh, and amplification processes happening, but this way, wave or this group of photons is so intense it starts to dominate very quickly dominates and you get an exponential growth rate of some wave and it, this becomes the dominant now and it's going back and forth and there are various tricks that are played now additional tricks uh, there could be several lines that are lasing you may have uh, a coating a coated optic in here called an etalon it's a frequency selector, so that if you happen to have um, several different lines that could be um, lasing, the etalon will block off and only allow one to go. Another thing, the angle here could be kind of big, actually, because there's a diameter of the rod here, and there's a length, and this angle could be a little bit large. So what's off? So what happens is a pinhole is put in here. So this is a pinhole. And the pinhole will block the, radi the, the amplified radiation that was coming out here will be blocked. And now the only thing that gets through is a smaller angle. Um, 
this way. Call it delta theta. So the diameter is smaller because of the pinhole, and the angle is smaller. And you choose this pinhole so that the D, the diameter, and the angle is approximately equal to lambda over 2. This is a condition for what we call spatial coherence. If you do this, if you can control this product, we call it a phase space product, then the radiation that comes out will have a beautiful wavefront, and it will appear to come from a point source. Because in fact, if you look back from here and you use Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, if I see radiation coming out at a certain uh, ang uh, wavelength and within a certain angle, uh, you could use Heisenberg's un uncertainty principle and look back and say, how, how small of an object can I see here? If it's, if it's smaller than that, I won't know it's any smaller. This is Heisenberg's uncertainty. What's the uncertainty of the size? If I know the angle and the wavelength, it's, uh, it's one, one form of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And if you look back, you'll say, ah, I can only see things uh, at a certain size d and no smaller than that. If it's any smaller, I can't tell that it's any smaller. That, this, is, this comes directly from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's not the only way to get there, but it's one of the simplest ways to get there. And so, this, and so it's telling you, it's as small as you can tell. It's the equivalent of a point source. Because of this finite wavelength, you just couldn't tell if it was any more of a point source than it is. And, and this is the number. Okay? So basically, so, so a ca uh, inside the cavity of a visible light laser, there is a pinhole. And it sets the spatial coherence. The laser itself doesn't necessarily have good spatial coherence properties. It would, without the pinhole, the wavefront would not, not be nice spherical wavefronts, it would be some screwy wavefront. Okay? And you would say, uh, it's twice the fraction limited, or 10 times the fraction limited. And the very first, um, most of the so-called X-ray lasers was, were thousands of times bigger in phase space than, uh, than, than the limiting condition, the diffraction limiting uh, condition. Okay, so you, and, and how, how, did, how does that change? Uh, well, you, you put a pinhole in there, or you arrange in your plasma condition that the length and the diameters are small. In fact, that was one of the, the ways that Roker initially got attention was that he had some lasers where the product of the size and the angle were approximately set by this condition. And then we understood that he had, he had reached a condition of spatial coherence. So I'm, I'm, this is this is spatial coherence. There's another thing called uh, temporal coherence, and that's related to how wide is this line. And so if you've not, if you've got a single line now, at some wavelength lambda, and it has a bandwidth, it's a very narrow line delta lambda, then there's a coherence length, which is equal to lambda squared over delta lambda. For various reasons, you might want to put a constant in front of here. And in my book, I put a half. Okay, And so this, is, this one is, is spatial coherence, meaning how good is the wavefront. And this is uh, called temporal or, lo or longitudinal uh, coherence. I'll give you an example of why they, why they matter in a moment. But can I stop talking myself for a moment and let you people talk? Those of you who kind of understand it, please keep keep speaking because, or any of the faculty members, please. How would you have said it differently, or what else would you add to that? Something. If nobody says anything, I'm going to speak a little bit more about. I'm going to show you the coherence slides and how you measure them. Say again? Yeah, so transverse and spatial. I'm sorry, I should have said that. So this one's called either temporal or longitudinal, and this is called spatial or transverse. And what it means is going across the wavefront transversely, it means that if you knew the phase 
some point here, if you have good transverse coherence, then you, if you knew the phase here, you could tell me what's, what's the phase at some other point. If this, if this was P1 and this was P2, the expectation of the, you know, the electric field at one and the electric field at two, if it's transverse coherent, that means that this number is very high. The expectation is very high that if you know it at one point, you know it at another point. If the transverse coherence is poor, because you didn't put the pinhole and you had this wobbly wavefront, then the transverse coherence is not so good. So this is set Yes, exactly. So these are just these are just names, and they're set by the pinhole, and this is also different names, and it's set by the bandwidth. Yeah. And so, for instance, um, if you were making a hologram, uh, let's say you were making a visible light hologram. Let's see how quickly I could draw a diagram. Here. You had some laser here. And it's an un undergraduate lab or something like that. So the light's coming out. And let's see, you put a beam splitter here. So some of the light comes. Uh, I did that wrong. <laughs> Let me change this. I have more, more room in the bottom direction. You put a beam splitter here. So some light comes through and some bounces off. And now down here, you put a mirror. And light's going like this. And maybe you put another another mirror here, so this comes like this. And now you have some objects here. Mm, how can I do this? Yeah. Object one and object two. And so this is, this is li and you have some lens here. So you open this up and you now have some, li some light coming onto these objects. And here, how am I going to do this? So here we have some film. And this light, I'm going to just adjust it so. And again, you have maybe a lens so that you focus the light and it comes up like this. So this we'll call the reference on. And this we'll call the object on. Because this light's going to come and illuminate the, ob the object. The laser light, small helium neon laser, is splattering off these two objects. And so there's some light from them coming onto the film. <laughs> this is supposed to say film. Some, some high resolution film. So there's some scattered light coming to all different parts of the film. And there's some nice wavefront here coming in. This is the reference wavefront. And these, the, this combines with this over here. It makes a very complicated interference pattern. Once you record it, you can block this and put on this illumination and look back here. Look back through the hologram. And when you look back through the hologram, although this object is, there's no more light here, you've removed this object. When you look back, this light will interfere with this recorded diffraction interference pattern, and it will produce light coming out to you. And it will reconstruct exactly to the object that you originally had there. So this is a visible light hologram. Okay? And, but it requires interference. And if you have coherence, you'll have, you can have interference. It's one of the big properties of coherent radiation. It can produce a nice interference pattern. If you don't have coherence, both. Yeah, you need both. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, because I want to bring that point out. So anyway, if you look back, you can see this. And depending on which angle you look back, you'll see what, what the, inter the interference pattern here depends on what the film saw at that angle. But um, if, it's, uh, if you look back from here, you'll see what, was, what, was the, what caused the diffraction pattern here. So by looking back at different angles, for instance, if you look back here, the diffraction pattern here only got light from this object and part of this. It never, it never got any light. No light came from the, the bottom part of object one and got, got blocked. So the diffraction pattern here only saw 
this thing and part of this one. So if you move your eye over and you look from here, you see only, par only part of this object, this block. And as you move your head around, ah, now you can see it. So you get the real sense of three-dimensionality. This is the real three-dimensional hologram, okay? So, okay, to do it, you required uh, a good, a laser that put out a very nice wavefront with a decent coherence length. You needed both of those to produce the interference here. And so, for instance, using a laser pointer probably doesn't work. Okay, laser pointers need to produce a lot of light, but they don't necessarily need a lot of coherence. Okay, so here you have some decent laser. But what you need to do here is, first of all, you need a wavefront, which is very good. So you need a good spatial coherence coming out of here for sure, because you're mixing up all different parts. This reference wave is mixing with all different parts of this wavefront that got scattered. So there really has to be a good correlation anywhere on the wavefront. You definitely need spatial coherence. But you also need some co uh, longitudinal coherence. What you need is from the point where this is broken, you need the path length all the way to the film, to the, let's say, to get to here. This path length, delta L1, and this path length, delta L2, have to be almost identical. Om they have to be pretty similar to each other within this distance, OK? So you measure the distance from here to the mirror, down to the object, and then over to different places on the film. That's delta L1. Delta L2 is the reference one, down to here, through the lens, and to different places on the wavefront. And you look at delta L1 minus delta L2, and that has to be less or equal to the coherence length. Because beyond this coherence length, you don't have any interference. That, that's what this thing, that's really what this thing is. It's saying that we were talking about expectation of fields. What is the expectation of fields when you have something like this? Rather than, than P1 and P2 over here, what about P1 and P2 over here? Okay. The expectation of knowing this, the electric field at E2, when you already know what the phase and amplitude is at E1, that's this correlation. You only can do this, it's done well within the coherence length. If you go too far, you, you don't have good coherence. Okay? So now let me give you a silly but effective explanation of spatial and temporal coherence. Suppose you have a lot of soldiers. Let's say there's students. David, I'll put it up. Oh, terrific. You can use it. Well, you do it then. OK, this is the <laughs> I'm Because I'm too embarrassed to do it. <laughs> I'm not, not going to do the marching. <laughs> You're not going to march? Oh. You, you've heard of Colin Webb, I imagine. No. Uh, Webb blazers in, in Oxford. He oh. gave a lecture once. He, other people have heard of Colin Webb. And he used to march up and down in front of the class. Mm, I do it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but um. This is what I use in my, one of my first year modules to demonstrate coherence. So this is obviously, which one is that? That's longitudinal. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's in the direction of the march or the yeah. direction of propagation. Yeah. And this one is yeah, transfer of Yeah. And this middle one, which may not be very clear, is yeah, both. Well, it's yeah. I've got a partial because oh. no, not, not very well in step. Yeah, OK. Um, Can I add to that then? Of course, yeah. Yeah, so in my, so here's, here's all the, the student marchers. We said student marchers, so we're not militarists. Um, but let's say they're all marching this in this here direction. And there's a person over here. We'll call him the captain or something like that. And he's calling what they call, in the US, they call cadence. He's saying one, two, three, four, or he says, hut, one, two, three, one, hut, one, two, three, four. And so every time he makes this one, two, three, four, they're all supposed to put their right foot down, okay? So they're all marching, and that's the phase now. This is like the photons are in phase. Every person marching is putting their right foot down, and you can hear the noise for every single person in the group, okay? And we would call transverse coherence how well 
they're putting their foot down exactly at the right time in this direction, that would be transverse. And in this direction, the longitudinal, how well all of these people or all of these people uh, are putting their foot down at exactly the right moment. So if they're all doing it perfect, then we say this is fully coherent. Com both transverse and temporal coherence is as good as you can get. Now, suppose it's a windy day. It's a windy day so that only some people can hear. So the people very close to him can hear it, and they're doing, they're putting their foot down at the right time. But people who are a little bit further away, maybe they're, they're back further, the wind is blowing this way, and they can't hear. They, they don't hear him. So the longitudinal coherence is kind of poor. And the transverse coherence, the same thing, depending on how far away they can hear. So this would be a transverse coherence length, and the condition for the photons is this one. And um, this is the longitudinal coherence length. Okay? How well is that? Does everyone have the phase right? Are they putting their foot down at the right time? So it, it's sort of like, rather than this, it's more like this. Are they putting their foot down? That's, that's the phase that they have to get right. Okay? And so with the photons, you're asking, so here you would ask, if I know when this person is putting his foot down, do I know about these other people in this direction? or do I know about other people in this direction? That's an expectation of understanding the cycle, the, the precise part of the cycle. And that's these two conditions relate to that. So if you have beautiful spherical wave fronts here, then you can predict if this is the peak of the wave, you know, there's a, a wavelength like this. If you know it here, then you know it anywhere. In this condition, you know it everywhere. If the source is too big because you didn't put a pinhole here, you probably don't know it. Okay? And in the longitudinal direction, this is the condition. And the constant is an arbitrary, a little bit arbitrary choice. Okay, so now we can sort of understand why there's some limitations on the, the so-called X-ray lasers. Actually, the photon energies are almost always, or not almost always, they are always in the EUV region. Okay? All of the lasers that you m might have heard of are really at wavelengths, which are around 10 nanometers, 40 nanometers, something like that. Okay? Uh, but they have exceptionally sharp lines so they have, uh, delta lambda is very small, so they have good longitudinal coherence, but because they don't have a pinhole in here, they may not be very good transverse coherence. So the early X-ray lasers had, uh, had a condition where this product was not lambda over two, but it was a thousand times bigger than that. Okay, so the Livermore lasers and the Princeton laser uh, did not satisfy this condition at all. But they did very well on this condition. So maybe I said everything I should say about X-ray lasers. Let me say more than about the coherence. Um, well, here again, so here are some of the wa wavelengths that Roca was able to get to laser. And they, w they weren't all spatially and temporal coherence. Ah, um, but John offered a great suggestion of something to talk about. Roca did an experiment where he produced the, he, uh, uh, this is a good one, actually. He did a very nice experiment. Uh, so again, he has some, he puts laser light on this thing, and he heats this up to a certain temperature, and it gets it to laser on one of these different uh, lines. But he and uh, but the the exit light has a diameter and an angle which normally would be much much greater than lambda over two. Okay, so he takes a, he actually he uses a tie sapphire he uses a high harmonic of tie sapphire at the same wavelength. So here he's producing, he's producing here radiation, which is a kind of screwy wavefront, but a really nice 
narrow line, uh, lambda and delta lambda, where, where delta lambda over lambda is about 10 to the minus 4. Oops. It's about 10 to the minus 4. So you get a, he's got very good temporal coherence, but not very good spatial coherence, or um, transverse coherence. But he synchronously runs from here with a high harmonic, high harmonic of, um, of a tie sapphire laser. So in here, he's coming with uh, the, the, tie, the high harmonic, which we abbreviate HHG. Uh, it comes in here. It has very good spatial coherence. So this is very good. Okay, this is good, whereas this was not good. And, uh, but rather, it doesn't have a nice narrow line, but it's a tie sapphire, it's a femtosecond, maybe say 50 femtoseconds, I don't know how long it was, but it has a very broad spectrum. So it has, uh, this is not so good. Because the spectrum here, delta lambda, is so large, this would be not very much longitudinal coherence. So the tie sapphire la so he's got both happening at the same time. He uses this laser to produce the hot plasma here, gets it to laze, but he injects, he injects a seed laser. So normally this laser, if he didn't do this, this process, remember, it was statistical. It just there's a lot of atoms here, that, or ions, that just started throwing off photons at different times because it was a hot plasma, and eventually you got some amplification. But it just started from noise. But now, he's going to inject a relatively strong wavelength, uh, a strong laser line, um, uh, a high harmonic, at the same photon energy. So it's overlapping this one very much. And this thing winds up being a filter. This thing is injecting, and this is what, rather than get amplified from noise, this is going to get amplified. This has spatial coherence. This one didn't have spatial coherence to start with, but now you, you do the same experiment with, with the seed, where the seed is this high harmonic in the same energy region but broader, and uh, the seed is causing the amplification to start, not from noise, but from an existing wavefront. And so it starts the multiplication, the avalanche process, and now the output is, is nice wavefronts. So by injecting with a high quality wavefront, he's improved the spatial coherence. This, this one, however, had not so good temporal coherence, but this laser is acting like an amplifier, a very wavelength selective amplifier. It only lasers on this one narrow line of 10 to the minus 4 bandwidth. So all of this radiation doesn't get amplified going through here. Only the little part, the narrow little part here, comes out. Okay, So it's filtering the, in the longitudinal sense, so the temperature. So the output now is a very narrow line. So this is good, and this is good. So with this, he gets good temporal and spatial coherence. It's a cute experiment. Small question of that. So the temporal coherence is related to the monochromacity of the laser output, or exactly? The... Okay. Yeah, exactly correct. The, what he said was the, monoch uh, the monochromaticity sets the temporal coherence or longitudinal coherence at the output. Okay, and the transverse coherence normally. In this kind of laser, there's no cavity, so it would be not so good. The wavefront would be terrible. But by injecting with a good spatial wavefront, uh, you can get the both. So that was a good example. Um, uh, this is John Costello's idea last night to put this into the lecture. Okay. If we have a few minutes. Oh, sorry. So yeah, so here's some picture representing what we meant by longitudinal or temporal coherence. The dark line here, the solid line, 
is uh, some light that's propagating along, and it's going some distance. And the coherence length is chosen to be a distance where if you had, a, if you had radiation at a center wavelength lambda and some bandwidth delta lambda, so there were different wavelengths there, even though it's a narrow line, one part in, let's say, 1,000 or something like that, there are different uh, emission wavelengths which are all happening, and they're captured by extremes of the dark line and the dashed line, lambda and lambda plus delta lambda. And the longer wavelength, if you propagate a certain number of cycles, they'll become out of phase. And so they're not interfering constructively anymore. They're interfering destructively. And in fact, there's some spread of wavelength. So it's not even as clear as this. It's quite messy. So that's how you could define a coherence length, longitudinal coherence length. And that's why in the visible light laser, you had to make sure everything went through the same path length within this distance so that you just had constructive interference. You don't want just random smudges on the film. So that's the temporal coherence. And the spatial coherence, of course, is across the wavefront. And here, forget the blue dot for a moment. Just look at this one, the purple one. So it's a point source. It's giving nice wavefronts. And you're sampling the wavefront at point P1 and point P2. And at those points, this light it only had one one point, not this one. And if it's spherically coherent, you would get an interference pattern here, which is very high modulation. Okay, So that, the point source is spatially coherent by definition. Um, suppose the source, or suppose this, you make a bigger source. Well, let's start with two point sources, just for the beginning. Another point source, so these, its wavefront, also perfect, but slightly tilted. And now, the distance from here to here and here to here is not the same as before. So the wave, the phase at these two different points isn't quite the same, but everything's still perfect. You still get a perfect interference pattern, but it's shifted up a little bit, okay? So now imagine that you had a source which had a, a bunch of point sources spread out here enough so that you had some point sources down here and this dashed line shifted to the point where the peak of the dashed line was right in the middle. Now, you don't have any interference pattern. It gets washed out. So there's some limit. And if you just go through some geometry of this, you can get this condition uh, that the, the product of the angle and the size should be about lambda over 2 in order to get um, good interference fringes. Okay? So that's the spatial coherence. So then there's a few more slides that just show you some examples of how this works in different situations there. Well, so here's another one. Well, th this is coherence theory. If you read books about coherence theory, they'll talk about um, what's the ex normalized expectation of if you knew the field at one point and at another point. And you could be at two different times. And again, if you have some radiation field, you could ask, what's the correlation between two points which are separated transversely and longitudinally? And you can't always separate this, but if you have some even partial coherence, you can break it up into the transverse part and the longitudinal part. So these are things not new. Yes? Yeah, well, we say different things. One thing we'll say, if the product of the size and the angle is not lambda over 2, let's say it's 3 lambda, we would say it's 6 times diffraction limited. We use the word diffraction limited and coherence sort of interchangeably. So if we could measure the angle and what was the apparent uh, emission size, we would say something about that. That would be some measure. And then the other thing is what, what you're asking about. So if you didn't have perfect um, modulation, 100% modulation, you had something less than that, uh, that's what you're asking, some 
quantitative measure than that. We would just say, rather than have 100% modulation, we'd say it had 50% or 20%, something like that. Okay, I think you saw enough of that. This is from a Scientific American article by Arthur Charlow, Art Charlow, who uh, won a Nobel Prize for uh, laser spectroscopy. And he's showing, I guess I showed you this already, but it, it brings up the same points. He has a light bulb which gives off many colors from a large area. So the D here, in this equation, the D and the theta, the D is really big here. This is a light bulb. It's not meant to be coherent. And it has many colors, which he represents by just two colors, red and blue. And he says, OK, I can do two things. I can put a pinhole in front of the light bulb. And if I make the pinhole small enough, what comes out is spherical wavefronts. And it's true. Okay, and then I can have spatial coherence, but I lost a lot of flux. I had a lot of area here. It's, uh, it's like a circle or something. And so I really lost a lot of power. I did what's called spatial filtering. Okay? I took laser light, which was not spatially coherent, and I, and I selected only the part that is spatially coherent. So this is the pinhole, and this is spatially coherent. The other thing I could do is I could put a filter or a monochrometer that chooses only one, one wavelength. So he blocked the blue and he passed the red, okay? Uh, this one, he didn't put the pinhole, so it's spatially mixed up, but it's just one narrow line, the red. And then I, he could do the, the both. He could put the filter and the pinhole both, and now he's got spatially and temporally coherent radiation, and now he can make the hologram that we were talking about before. But this was the, case, the time I, uh, I'm, when I showed this the first time, I said that I was I was a plasma physicist, and I was starting to do probing of plasmas with light, and I wanted to use holographic interferometry, and I was working in the lab by myself. I was kind of ignorant, and I got the great idea that I could do this, and I would have, even with a, not a laser, but even with some light source, I could make spatially and temporally coherent light, and I could make holograms, and I could do my interferometry. And this is when I told you I ran to the library and found out that the rest of the world already knew this. Lots of people knew this. But anyway, so this, rep, this is a good illustration of what was going on there. And uh, in the synchrotron community, I just put this in mainly because of these equations. But in the simple terms, it doesn't matter what the source of radiation is. This diagram captures it all. There is some effective diameter. It may be distributed in three dimensions. But there's some effective diameter and some effective half angle. In fact, I made a mistake there. This should be the half angle. And these are the two expressions for temporal and spatial coherence. Uh, this is in, uh, this thing says lambda over 2 pi. This says a half lambda. This is because these were RMS quantities. The synchrotron people and the FEL, the synchrotron people in particular, use um, RMS, 1 over square root of E. Um, where the laser people would use full width at half max, and then it would be lambda over 2. So with an undulated radiation on a synchrotron, the source is relatively big, and it's highly elliptical, OK? And it has a broad bandwidth. And so uh, we do experiments, coherent imaging experiments, there by putting a pinhole in front of it and a monochrometer. And so we narrow the bandwidth with a monochrometer. We narrow the angle and the size with the pinhole. And we do this, but now I wanted to show you a few of these diagrams. Oops, not a good place to sit. So here's the here's the thing we were looking at before, and I think the next one you've seen also. Yeah. So th these are the, the diagrams that you've seen before, and um, the spatial and temporal coherence enter into this. Uh, Young's double slit experiment in that how far you separate these two points. You can just keep, you could move these two points closer and further away, and quite a few groups do this actually with uh, measuring the coherence of synchrotron radiation, free electron lasers, high harmonics. Uh, we play the game of repeating the measurement with the separation changing. So we're changing the angle theta. There is some wavelength, and there is some effective source size, which we don't know. And we're trying to find out how close is it to being spatially coherent. So we change the angle theta here, 
and we watched the fringe pattern collapse. And I have some results here. I just didn't put them on the slide. And so this is measuring this condition. And then how many fringes do you see in this direction? It depends on how much of a difference in path length you can handle. Here, the photons are coming from, uh, from some uh, uh, difference in position. You know, Light is coming out of these two slits. And then here, the two path lengths are the same, exactly the same. And so you get a maximum interference. And then here, from here to this point, the extra path length in this direction and decrease is just enough for a half wavelength, and you get um, destructive interference, OK, the null. So it's, not, it's not bad. It's just part of the cycle. But how many fringes can you see? How many interference? That depends on this coherence length, because what you're measuring is the difference in path length from here and here, or from the source, from these two positions up to here, when this gets to be about equal to your coherent, the difference in path lengths gets about equal to your coherence length, your fringe contrast is dropping very quickly. Okay? So uh, with Young's double slit, you can measure the spatial and the temporal coherence length. Okay? Is that, does that sound like magic, or you understood it? It's okay. So there's a little bit more fun coming. Suppose now you have a bunch of emitters, but they're uncorrelated. It's like a light bulb. Okay. Um, now you still get you can as long as this is small enough and the angles, the, the diameter and the angles satisfy this condition, you'll still get this nice fringe. You can still make holograms, right? But if you look at the field, the electric field here. It's a mess. Okay, what's happening is the size is constrained enough here that every one of these point source rate, every one of these atoms or uh, emitters, every one of them is constrained enough in angle, in size and angle that they're all producing the same interference pattern. It's a self-interference pattern of this particle, and there's a self-interference of this particle, but they're uncorrelated. So their electric fields are not, are not adding up over time, right? They're just completely washed out. The only interference you have is the electric field from this guy going through this hole and this hole producing this pattern. And then completely separately, all of the different particles are producing this. And in fact, if you make it too big, they, they won't be overlapping. So th I call this the persistence of fringes. Here is the fringes. And it's persistent that you keep this thing as long as you keep the size here uh, within this constraint. Okay? So you're making holograms, but with each of the emitters acting separately. And so what's adding up here is the electric fields are adding up to give some contribution to the intensity. And the interference pattern is just from one particle, but they're all doing the exact same thing. But again, if you look at the electric field here, it's completely random because the phases of the emission of all of these guys is random. Now comes a different situation. Suppose they're not random. Suppose they're correlated somehow or other. All of the emitters are, are uh, em emitting in a phase relationship to each other. Now the electric fields from all of the particles add up the exact same way. And you get this nice phase information. So how does this help you? Well, you can still make the same hologram. You could, it hasn't really affected the resolution of imaging or the holography that you can do. But it has really affected the net electric field here. Because the electric field in this case is there are three times four. So there are 12 emitters here. The electric field is now 12 times as big and the intensity is e squared, so it's 144 times bigger, so more intense. So what you've done here is you haven't really improved the coherence properties, but you really made a big difference on the amount of power or intensity that you've got. And who plays this game the best? This is a picture of, this is a comparison of what we call undulators and free electron lasers. An undulator is a bunch of electrons randomly located. 
uh, with each other that go through uh, a, 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 a periodic magnet. And as they go through, each of these electrons oscillates and gives off radiation. Okay, But they, because they're uncorrelated in the far field, their electric fields are, are just washed out. The only thing that's contributing to intensity is each one. So the intensity out here, if there are n particles, capital N, the power or intensity far away is n times the power of one electron. Okay? But suppose you make uh, a free electron laser where you started in this process, but eventually you had a longer undulator. This thing might be a few meters. This might be a kilometer. Okay. Now the, 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 lasing, the free electron lasing process is to go from this to nicely defined rows of electrons. And now the electric field that you get out here is n times as big. And so the n intensity is n squared times as big. Well, for the free electron laser, this number is like 10 to the ninth. So you're gaining, the E squared means you're gaining about 10 to the ninth. So this is an example of where these, these coherencies come into effect. So I think we had a good discussion of spatial coherence, temporal coherence, random phase, well-defined phase, the correlation effects and uncorrelated effects. They're all things you have to pay a little attention to. Ah, so this is a good, no, a good point. So he's pointing out that the, if you look at the intensity versus time out here, the intensity is fluctuating. And the reason it's fluctuating is it's not so perfect like it's, uh, it's more like the following. This is called SASI, right? Self-amplified spontaneous emission, SASI. That's what the diagram is there. And so I showed that at, you know, there's a long undulator, and I showed at the end that it looked like this. Very nicely defined, okay? And I showed it using up the whole thing. But in fact, what actually happens is there's another one over here. It's not like there's one set of micro bunches, but there's several of them. And they're slight, they can be slightly different in the number <coughs> in each one, and also slightly different in the separation. The, the undulator has a bandwidth which is a, a little bit wide. It's a 1 over n bandwidth, where n could be 200 or something like that. So it's kind of wide. So what happens then is you get Let's say this guy gives you this line. This guy gives you a slightly different line. And this one, again, slightly different. They're all within this envelope. And the intensities are varying. This one's got 10 to the ninth, but this one's only got 10 to the eighth or something like that. So it's a factor of 100 down or something. And all of these things are happening. And so the intensity, if you plot now uh, intensity versus time, you, you get spikes. You get noise spikes. You have terrific coherence in every one of them. In fact, we measured it and we published it in one of the early Fitzgerald letters about FEL coherence. But you get this, this thing. So this is not so good. For instance, spectroscopists or people who want to do imaging or any kind of probing that depends on having a particular narrow line, this is not so good. This, having this, this amplification process is terrific and it's always the case. But the intensity, so this is a SASE spectrum. And so to beat this, they put in a seed, or self-seed. And so this is what's happening. Right? This is the most active thing, interesting thing going on right now on the free electron, besides the applications. So this is, in the example that I showed you, there's actually a bunch of these things. And there's still some spikes. Okay, but uh, um, yeah. if you can start with a coherent seed pulse, so people are thinking about using high harmonics. And in fact, the Fermi FEL in Trieste, Italy, uses a, a high harmonic seed pulse to get 
this kind of result. So to get rid of the spikes and get a single frequency. But the people at, uh, this is a very international team um, at Stanford, at LCLS, they've used an effect called self-seeding, where they put a, um, they start, they break the, the undulator is already in, in many parts. The undulator is in parts. Just because they can't, it's, it's a kilometer long, so it comes in parts. So this is, you know, north, south, north, south, north, south, north, south. And what they do is, after a certain propagation distance, I'll make a simple diagram. They put in a crystal, an x-ray crystal. And what it does is the x-ray crystal gets rid of several of these things. And this they call self-seeding. Because it's starting from the noise, it's starting with SASE, but they're using it. So they would also like to use the high harmonic, but they're in the X-ray regime. Fermi is in less than 100 EV, I forget, maybe 30 EV or something like that. So uh, they, can, they can use a high harmonic very effectively to do it. But for LCLS uh, and the future X, XFEL at Daisy Lab, they're into higher photon energies, maybe 10 kilovolts. And so the high harmonics are petering off at that point. Uh, well, this is the intensity of the final line. Um, there is any the variation, actually it doesn't. Because in LCLS, they're not using all of their ample, um, undulator modules because, you, so you're apparently, you're familiar with these things, but they're going off and they're getting it, uh, I'm sorry, they're getting into saturation, but they still have a long length to go. So when they put this in, they lose, but they just go to another, they just use another one of the modules to get back what they lost. So they're okay. Yeah. But they still prefer to put a seed in from the beginning, but this is a good way to do it. They, they still have some amplitude variation here because it's still starting from noise. They, have a, they, they still have some intensity variation, but they don't have wavelength in variation. So that helps a lot for many experiments. OK, so we did a little bit about lasers and x-ray lasers and various aspects of coherence. Uh, chapter 8 in the book has most of this coherent stuff. These things about the FEL are, are, are on the website. But then they're not in a YouTube website. Uh, they're not in YouTube because we didn't record the, that one. But these slides here are from a class website, which is, I don't know if it was probably handed, probably in one of the handouts is a picture of the, the building, which we call the Campanile, and it has some websites. And probably the last one has these things. Okay. Thank you all for your patience. We can talk more over coffee.